Okay. Is Sharon Govich a top six player or does Jack Hughes make him look better? Or is it a combination of both? And also, is Fabian Zetterlin better than Alexander Holtz? Have I lost faith in Holtz already? Well, we have a lot to talk about in today's episode, so buckle up, everybody. Your Locked On Devils, your daily podcast on the New Jersey Devils, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hi, this is Bryce Salvador, and you're Locked On Devils with Trey Matthews. Alrighty now, what is up, New Jersey? Welcome back to the Locked On Devils podcast here on the Locked On Network. I'm your host, college hockey play-by-play announcer, and also Devils writer for Pucks and Pitchforks, Trey Matthews. Glasses are on for the third straight episode, and I hope you guys have been enjoying it so far because I am still recovering from my sinus infection, so still pressure on my eyes, but the show must go on, and my throat is starting to feel a little bit better, so you uh, hear me talking a little bit at a higher volume right now. Because, like I said, still recovering, but starting to feel better each and every day. And uh, tomorrow is going to be my 500th episode, and I have a special guest lined up. It is Cam Jensen. He is the host of Cam and Stick podcast, and he's also a former NHL enforcer. A lot of you probably have fond memories of Cam Jensen and just getting into big fights. So he will be on tomorrow's show for my 500th episode. And I just want to thank you guys in advance for uh, sticking by me through the entirety of these last two or so years of me being a part of the Locked On Podcast Network. 500 episodes. It's still crazy to think about how long I've been doing the show and how I'm going to continue to grow and develop and Uh, The season is right around the corner, and I can't wait for that. But in the meantime, before I talk to Cam Jensen tomorrow, I still want to address some things in regards to yesterday's episode. So first and foremost, I want to just apologize. It's a minor thing, but I pride myself of putting out the best possible product that I can potentially put out there. So I made a mistake in yesterday's episode. So I said Damon Severson's draft stock will go up when – when I was talking about the possibility of him being dealt away, what I meant to say was Damon Severson's trade stock will go up if he has a good season. Forgot to edit that part out. So I apologize in advance. I realized it when I was watching the episode once again, and then I was just like, wait a minute, this is live. There's nothing I could do about that. So I uh, we'll want to apologize for that. And also when talking about the Metropolitan Division, I want to reiterate to you guys, I don't think the Metropolitan Division is one of the weakest divisions in the NHL. I may have explained it uh, not the best that I possibly could have. I said that the Metro has gotten weaker compared to the last couple of years, which makes it a little easier for New Jersey Devils to possibly make some noise. So just wanted to address that. But you guys, regardless, still left me some decent amount of comments that I could work with to try to incorporate into a full-fledged episode. So one of the talking points that somebody brought up to me was that they don't believe that Yegor Sharangovich is a top six player because he was absent for pretty much the first 20 or so games. It took him a while to finally get his legs underneath them and just finally be that offensive plug that we were so hoping that he was going to be after his somewhat respectable rookie year. So if you guys recall, during the 2021 56-game uh, shortened COVID season, Sharon Govich appeared in 54 games. He had 16 goals, 14 assists for a grand total of 30 points, and he had a plus minus of negative four. And he was in the running for the Calder Memorial Trophy. Obviously, he wasn't going to win it because of Kaprizov, but still, Sharon Govich had a surprising year for New Jersey Devils because I don't think anybody was expecting for him to be that somewhat productive for the Devils during the course of that year. I certainly wasn't expecting it, but he was on the watch list coming out of training camp saying, here are some players that could surprise some Devils fans. And he surprised a lot of people, especially uh, him getting his first goal of the year. It was a game winner against the Boston Bruins. So we had high expectations going into this past season for Sharon Govich saying that maybe Sharon Govich will take his game to another level. Maybe Sharon Govich could be this, maybe Sharon Govich could be that, but Ultimately, like that person did uh, uh, say, I believe this person hit me up on Twitter and said, Sharon Govich, not a top six player because he wasn't there for the first 20 or so games in in regards to his overall production, not him being away from the team. But 
my overall thing is this about Sharon Govich. I still believe he is a top six player. So this past season, he appeared in 76 games. He had 24 goals, 22 assists for a grand total of 46 points, and he had a plus minus of negative 14. So here's my overall stance with Sharon Govich. Yes, you are correct. Sharon Govich did not have a good start to the year, but my thing is this. Jack Hughes got hurt second game of the year against the Seattle Kraken, and what's the one thing that I said going into last season? I said that Jack Hughes has to remain healthy because one of the things that I did mention was that Jack Hughes, he is kind of that person who is able to get the most out of Sharon Govich and also Kwokanen at the time last year. That's why Kwokanen was also on the top six to begin the year because he had a decent year and he closed out the season on a high note, mostly because Jack Hughes made him look good. Now, the question I had for Sharon Govich was, if Jack Hughes hypothetically does not play in a game, whether it's by injury or something else, can he still have that somewhat respectable production? And ultimately, the answer was no. So for that person, you are correct. Sharon Govich was pretty much a no-show at the beginning of the year, and Jack Hughes being injured certainly didn't help things because Jack Hughes got, once again, got hurt second game of the year against the Seattle Kraken. So Sharon Govich was pretty much a deer in headlights. And it got to a point where I was like, you know what? Maybe Sharon Govich needs to be a healthy scratch because his production is just not there. And the New Jersey Devils really need to find that offensive firepower sooner rather than later. But my thing is this about Sharon Govich. I haven't lost hope on him taking his game to another level because quite honestly, I still believe he did improve a little bit. The stats do show it, but then again, he did appear in 22 more games compared to his rookie year in 2021. So you definitely do need to take that into consideration. But at the same time, when he was on one, he was lights out. And I feel as though he was definitely a threat to score for a New Jersey Devils, whether it was scoring or maybe assisting on Jack Hughes's goals. So my thing is like, you pretty much have no choice but to put Sharon Govich on the top six, because I don't want to put Sharon Govich with Nico Heischer, no disrespect to Heischer, but I have more faith in Hughes getting the most out of them because case in point, look what happened towards the end of the 2021 season. And look what happened when Jack Hughes returned. Sharon Govich was able to also get a spark himself because Jack Hughes went on a tear once he returned from injury and Sharon Govich's numbers also improved as a result of that. So my thing is like, you pretty much have no choice, but to put Sharon Govich on the top line with Jack Hughes, because it seems as though without Jack Hughes, Sharon Govich doesn't function. Now, Here's the one thing that I do have some criticism towards Sharon Govich, which is you got to find your niche as a player because Jack Hughes is not going to be there all the time to bail you out. So my overall thing is simply this for Sharon Govich. You need to find a way to get the most out of your respective production and your offensive firepower without relying on Jack Hughes. Now, the fact of the matter is this, guys, everyone in whether it's in the NFL, the NBA, MLB, or even in the NHL, everyone has a tandem dynamic duo partner. And usually if that partner is absent for a game, usually that partner, it, it takes them a while to try to figure their game out. But yes, they do theoretically do get lost and they're not able to put up the same type of numbers uh, compared to when their partner is playing. So the same can be said for Hughes and Sharon Govich. They're just a dynamic tandem duo. And without Jack Hughes, it doesn't really function because Jack Hughes can function without Sharon Govich. Now, the question is, can Sharon Govich function without Jack Hughes? And that's one of the X factors I have going into the season. So I'm going to repeat what I said going into last season, which is I want to see Sharon Govich shine as a player, but I want him to do so without Jack Hughes. Now, that's going to be a little bit of a tall order considering the fact that I really hope Jack Hughes does play in most of the games this year. I'm hoping that he plays anywhere from 70 to all 82 games. I know that's a bit of a tall order, but I really think Jack Hughes is capable of doing so and hopefully leading the New Jersey Devils to the promised land back into playoff contention. So that's the overall question, which is, um, you know, what, what am I going to get out of Sharon Govich going into this year? What are my expectations? Well, I think his stats are going to improve. I think he's going to improve as a player. And yes, he got off to a slow start, but he was able to rebound. So that's something you can't take away from Sharon Govich was that despite getting off to a slow start, despite being a healthy scratches in a game or two, he was able to bounce back somewhat nicely. And he was able to just pad his stats a little bit as similar to what Jack Hughes was able to do in his return. Now, now it's just like, can he do it without Jack Hughes? That's just going to be the question 
going into the season. And that's just something we're going to have to wait and see come training camp when the exhibition games start, yada, yada, yada. So my overall thing is this. I believe whether you like it or not, Sharon Govich is a top six player. I feel as though he does have potential to form himself into a better player and hopefully just come into his own without the help of Jack Hughes. But that's a little hard to determine because do you really want to take the risk and put Sharon Govich on the same line as Nico Keisher? Or do you want to like, you know, maybe put him on the bottom six and see if he'll get production there? I feel as though like if you put him on the bottom six, you're just going to waste his potential and his talent. And he's not going to be too happy about that because it's just like, that's not a fair assumption because he's going to be seeing less minutes, but would he see more opportunities to score? I don't really know because one of the X factors that Jack Hughes has going for him is that Jack Hughes is able to create for his own teammates, not only for himself, but for the players around him, or maybe he is able to come into his own type of player. And maybe Lindy Ruff does pair him alongside with Nico. He sure. And maybe Jesper Bratt will go to the first line, or maybe Andre Pilat will go to the first line or the bottom six, like some people want him to. But ultimately my, my thing is this, like we're just going to have to wait and see what, how the season pans out for Sharon Govich. And if Jack Hughes is healthy for a good chunk of the first half and Sharon Govich still has not stepped up his game, then you're probably right. Maybe Sharon Govich is not a top six player and maybe Jack Hughes is making him look better. But then again, on the flip side of it, if Sharon Govich is able to, I'd say get three goals within the first week or two. And I know that's a bit of a tall order and I'm putting a lot of pressure on the kid's shoulders, but I'm just saying if he gets off to a pretty decent or a great start, then it, then there's really no ands or buts about it. He is a top six player. So my, the overall final statement for this segment is that whether you like it or not, he's on the top six, and I don't want to run the risk of pairing him alongside with Nico Heischer. If it ain't broke, do not fix it. Just keep it as it is and adjust accordingly. So him with Jack Hughes, it's a, it's a match made in heaven as far as I'm concerned for the time being. I want to bring you guys the first and only live read this morning, and it comes from our friends at Bet Online. So, BetOnline.net is the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your betting needs. Find all your favorite sports and events at the number one online source for odds, lines, and games. Find reviews and news of every league, including MLB, NFL, NBA, NHL, combat sports, esports, and even golf. BetOnline continues to be the top online resource for all your sport wagering information from live in-game betting, scores, and podcasts. They have everything you need. Head to BetOnline.net today or use your mobile device to learn more about the action happening right now. BetOnline, where the game starts. Please remember to gamble responsibly and visit our friends at Locked On Bets for all your betting needs there as well. Okay, let's switch subjects because this is a subject that has intrigued me for quite some time. So, as some of you already know, I have not lost faith in Alexander Holtz. But then again, I love Fabian Zetterlin. In the episode in which I covered Fabian Zetterlin signing his new contract with the New Jersey Devils, I said, despite all the popularity and the notoriety he gets amongst the Devils fan base, I genuinely believe that Fabian Zetterlin is somewhat underrated. Because I feel as though a lot of people aren't aware of what he was capable of doing in the 14 games that he was given. And it's not just Zetterlin, but, you know, look at someone like uh, Nolan Foote as well, who was given an opportunity to try to uh, just make a name for himself despite not doing well in Utica. And now on the flip side of it, it's like Alexander Holtz, when he was given an opportunity to try to prove himself at the NHL level, it just seemed like Alexander Holtz was just a deer in headlights. And it's just the, and just raises the question, which is, is Holtz the real deal? Is he a bust? Here's why I don't think Holtz is a bust. It's just because look what he was doing in Utica. So I'd say if he was struggling in Utica and obviously struggling struggling in the NHL, then that's when you raise the red flag and you're just like, oh, is Alexander Holtz the sniper that we thought he was going to be when we drafted him seventh overall just a couple of years ago? Or, you know, what, what, what's going to be happening to him? So my, my thing is this, since Alexander Holtz did so well in Utica, I don't think he's a bust. I just think we haven't been giving him a sizable role to try to prove himself because look what he was able to do during preseason uh, during the course of last year, because he and Dawson Mercer were neck and neck when it came to trying to get the final position, ultimately just due to his high hockey IQ and just him making plays that even mesmerized me. I, I said, Dawson Mercer, if I had to make a choice, I felt as though, 
Mercer was going to get the final roster spot over Alexander Holtz, but I would have liked for both of them to make the team. So that's something I want you guys to consider, which is Alexander Holtz, when he was given a decent role during preseason, he was able to dominate. Unfortunately, Dawson Mercer was just better than him in that regards. Now, uh, why am I talking about this? Because in the previous episode, I looked at the projected line combinations for New Jersey Devils, and one of the combinations was that they predicted that Fabian Zetterlin was going to make the opening night roster for New Jersey Devils, and he was going to play on the third line. Now, I made a controversial take, and I said, replace Fabian Zetterlin with Alexander Holtz, because here's the thing, guys. How are we supposed to know what Alexander Holtz's potential is if we don't give him a chance? That's my overall thing. So, Alexander Holtz, he's coming off a very good season with the Utica Comets. And some of you were like, look, Trey, he's got to earn it. He's got to work for it. And you're absolutely right. But my thing is, like, we cannot ignore what he was able to do in Utica and light it up down there. But then again, I might be a little hypocritical because I did say in my Fabian Zetterlin episode recently that I feel as though Zetterlin was one of the more underrated players for the New Jersey Devils because the production was certainly there in the 14 games that he suited up for them in. So I feel as though Fabian Zetterlin can definitely be somewhat of an X factor for the New Jersey Devils moving forward. And I also said that Fabian Zetterlin, in terms of his overall build, he has to be like one of the biggest guys out there. And he's only 22, so you know he's definitely going to – grow more ways than one. And one of the things that I wanted to see out of Fabian Zetterlin is that uh, I want to see him become more of an enforcer. Like, so I'm interviewing Cam Jensen for tomorrow's episode. And what's the one thing that Jensen was known for, which was being aggressive, being an enforcer. So I want to see that kind of thing for Fabian Zetterlin. I get that the time period of hockey has shifted a little bit more because essentially you can't even touch anyone without going to the penalty box. But my overall thing is this. I, I think Zetterlin just being a big guy and uh, ju just being able to be so good in the 14 games that he appeared in, I feel as though there's a lot of potential for him. And it was one of the reasons why I was so excited when he signed his new deal with the New Jersey Devils. And I feel as though he can definitely – uh, is he's definitely uh, a consideration to make the opening night roster. He stands five foot eleven. He weighs weighs about two twenty. According to Ryan Novozinski of NJ.com, the man can bench press uh, a lot. Like he can bench press like sixty plus his own weight or or something like that, which is very impressive. And he's and like I said, he's only twenty two, so he could definitely grow and develop in more ways than one. And I feel as though if he becomes an enforcer and he's able to put up the same type of offensive production that he's been able to do in the 14 games he suited up in, that's a, that's a very uh, coveted prospect that the New Jersey Devils have. So in the 14 games that Sederlin appeared in, he had three goals, five assists for a grand total of eight points, and he had a plus minus of plus five. So Sederlin was definitely a surprise in my books towards the end of the year. And I definitely consider him to be one of the more underrated assets for New Jersey Devils is because we don't really talk about him. But at the same time, I, I do need to take into consideration that Alexander Holtz could surprise a lot of people as well. So, like I said, guys, I haven't lost hope in Alexander Holtz just because the fact of the matter is simply this, which is what role did we give him? What role did we give him to succeed in? Because he appeared in nine games and had two assists and he had a plus minus a negative five. I get it. The, the stats do show that Fabian Zetterlin had the better, I guess, cup of coffee in the NHL. Fabian Zetterlin had like Tim Hortons or something, whereas Alexander Holt had some crappy third tier coffee shop that no one goes to, but it's just like a local business or or, or something like that. But ultimately, um, you know, when, when comparing Zetterlin and Holtz, yes, Zetterlin is the better player right now. But I guess my overall point is I don't want people to lose hope on Alex Holtz because I feel as though Holtz has so much to prove for New Jersey Devils. And I feel as though he is definitely a sniper. And like I said, he was lighting it up in Utica. So my thing is like, if he wasn't doing that, then that's when you're, you should be concerned about his overall development. But that wasn't the case. And one of the reasons why he didn't make the opening night roster this past year was simply because Lindy Ruff stated in an interview saying that we just felt as though we wouldn't be giving him a sizable role to do his thing. So in Utica, Holtz appeared in 52 games. He had 26 goals, 25 assists for a grand total of 51 points. So he's a point per game player. And that's impressive to do. I get it's the AHL, but still that, that should tell you something. 
And I think Alexander Holtz deserves to be talked about a lot more too. So the argument that I made for Fabian Zetterlin, him being underrated, I think we need to have that same towards of energy um, going in the way of Alexander Holtz, just because I feel as though he is also underrated because I hear a lot of people saying like, maybe we should trade away Alexander Holtz while the going is good. Maybe uh, we could get something out of it. And I heard a lot of people during my silly season episodes saying, Hey, Trey, I'm willing to trade away Alexander Holtz for like uh, Alex DeBrinkhead or Kevin Fiala or whatever the case might be. And I was just like, Maybe I would too, but maybe not for those same reasons because I think people are, are thinking that Alexander Holtz is going to be a bust or something. I would have just traded him away because we would be getting a good player at the time. But still, remember what I said about Pavel Zaka? He has a lot of untapped potential, and the same can be said for Fabian Zetterlin and Alexander Holtz. So when looking at the better player, I would say for right now as we speak, as this episode goes live, Fabian Zetterlin is a better player. But remember, uh, like I said, I'll use the same point that I used for Pavel Zaka, which is I think Alexander Holtz has a lot more potential to do something at the NHL level. So I don't want people to just, you know, look at the 14 games that Fabian Zetterlin appeared in. Uh, I, I want people to realize that I think that Alexander Holtz can also, if we give him a decent am amount of minutes and a sizable role, maybe he can also do something similar to that. But, uh, but we just didn't give him that. So when Fabian Zetterlin was in Utica, he also had an impressive year, 58 games, 24 goals, 28 assists for a grand total of 52 points. So Alexander Holtz also put up similar numbers like that in Utica, but yet why aren't we talking about that? Why aren't we acknowledging that? So I want people to also take that into consideration. So both of them, very good players. And I'm glad that we're having this debate. It just means that our prospect system is in good hands. So, when comparing Fabian Zetterlin and Alexander Holtz, I think Fabian Zetterlin is a better player right now. But for some reason, I just have more faith in Alexander Holtz for right now. I just think he has more untapped potential that we just need to unlock. And so that way the Devils could take it to another level. So let me know what you guys think. What do you think about Alexander Holtz and Fabian Zetterlin? Who is the better player? And do you believe that Sharon Govich is a top six player? As for today's episode, guys, that's all the time I have for you. So thanks for sticking by me. Once again, this is episode 499, and I appreciate the support. Episode 500 is going to be a big one. Cam Jensen is coming in on the show tomorrow for an interview. So I hope you guys enjoy it. As for today, that, like I said, that's all the time I have for you. So continue to stay safe. Have a wonderful day, New Jersey. Go Devils. I'll catch you guys in the next episode. Thanks for listening once again.